trauma-induced seismicity webinar series uh, coordinated with Jens Lundsneed and Mari Haddad. So uh, our, our monthly series continue and this morning we're very excited to have Eric Dunham with Stanford give a presentation on some of his modeling work, looking at modeling a seismic slip. As Eric was just uh, describing, important kind of model-based conceptual notions that I think uh, can closely tie to some of the, uh, the field observations that we're making. Um, so very excited for today's presentation. And as always, just uh, a few housekeeping items we want to cover before we uh, get started. And, uh, and apologies, I should have started off by wishing everyone a happy Easter. Um, so just quickly, uh, Last time we had Ivan Wong give a presentation on the uh, Induced Seismicity Guide, which was uh, about to be published and it was actually released and published this week. So uh, anyone that's interested, I've got uh, the link here, but uh, I'll put the copy of the link to the, the chat meeting through chat window through the meeting and uh, um, very interesting document, very very comprehensive, I think 249 pages long. So there was obviously a 250 page limit. So they came just under the, <laughs> the limit, um, but uh, good information, some uh, some light reading for Easter weekend if you're, uh, if you're interested. So with that, pass it over to Jens. Right, um, thanks, Sean. Yeah, so uh, we have a, a few more speakers signed up. We're going to be taking a break in June, by the way, for, for one month, um, but we'll be back to the regular time for all of these first Friday of the month, 10 a.m. Central. Um, Peter Hennings will be speaking next, and um, he'll be talking about some of the recent uh, earthquakes in the Permian Basin and um, the way that the Scissor Consortium Group at the Texas Bureau is um, changing its focus in, in various ways. Um, we are working on a speaker for uh, the first Friday of July, so stay tuned for that. And finally, Andy Barber from the USGS has agreed to speak uh, the first Friday, August uh, 6th. Thanks. And uh, sorry, just to jump in and add to that, the, uh, in terms of the, the June ARMA week meeting, we purposely uh, avoided having a webinar that week. Just for everyone's information, ARMA's announced that that's gonna be a, a purely virtual meeting. There have been hoping for a combination of uh, in-person and, and uh, virtual, but it's gonna be purely virtual. virtual. Um, there's a very strong uh, collection of papers around induced seismicity that we've been able to collect. So it looks like about 20 papers on induced seismicity. Programs just being finalized, but it looks like the papers will cover everything from lab observations to field um, modeling, seismic observations, and a good international um, uh, spread of, uh, of case studies. So looking like a, a very interesting program. More to come on that as, as the program gets finalized. Good morning, everyone. This is Mahdi Haddad at the Bureau of Economic Geology. First of all, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this webinar. Uh, so far, we have around 475 people in the list of uh, registered people for this uh, webinar uh, webinar series, uh, which are from uh, academic uh, institutions and industry and uh, le legislation organizations, uh, almost equally divided between these three sectors. Uh, so if you find anyone uh, who is interested in induced seismicity, please feel free to share the webinar invites with them. Uh, and also for better flow of this webinar, we uh, mute everyone during the talk, but after the talk, during the question and answer session, you can unmute uh, and verbally ask your questions. Uh, so you can ask your questions in the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting window. Uh, please send these questions to everyone for us to be able to ask these questions in a more timely manner. The Zoom meeting is recorded actually uh, for this uh, specific webinar and it will be uh, uploaded to our Induced Seismicity YouTube channel. I will put the link in the uh, chat window uh, after this. And uh, please subscribe to this channel to receive notifications for the future uploads. Uh, 
without further delay, let's invite Eric to start his talk. Eric, the stage is yours. All right, thank you so much for the invitation and opportunity to present today. So I'm gonna be talking about, uh, primarily about a seismic slip uh, that is induced by injection. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll also get into uh, swarm seismicity. This is a modeling talk. Uh, my group works primarily on, on theory and simulation. So maybe a bit different than some other talks in this series. Um, most of this work was done by my PhD student, Yu Yun Yang. Um, although other work towards the end of the talk will be presented or, or was done by two other students, uh, one current, one former at Stanford, Wei Chang Zhu and Callie Allison. It's been pretty clear that injection can cause seismicity, of course, and in most cases, or in many cases, that slip is seismic, but in other cases, it, it's likely to be aseismic. Uh, Carissa Pepin, working with Bill Ellsworth and others, have uh, examined INSAR data from the Delaware Basin in Texas. Uh, these show uh, the cumulative vertical uplift and horizontal uplift um, in the Delaware Basin over about, a, a, I think, a five-year time period. And it's a pretty large amount of uplift and subsidence that they interpret, or at least show, is, is consistent with slip on, on conjugate normal faults. Uh, with a slip being in the range of uh, about 20 centimeters. Um, so 20 centimeters of slip in no more than three to four years. And there's no large, the earthquakes there are not large enough to explain this. So presumably if, if indeed this interpretation is right, this is a pretty huge amount of aseismic slip. Um, it can happen also in a, uh, in situations where injection rates are, are much higher, so say during hydraulic fracturing. Um, here's an example from the Sichuan Basin in China where uh, the well was being hydraulically fractured. And you can see the micro seismicity cloud lights up a structure like this, presumably a fault. And this, um, this uh, essentially sh sheared the um, well. Here's a, a deformation of the casing from a caliper log. Uh, that's interpreted as, as uh, you know, several centimeters of slip. So, and again, there's no earthquakes large enough to explain this, so presumably this is a seismic slip that's being triggered by the fluid injection. Um, another common observation is that microseismicity, you know, small earthquakes, uh, tend to migrate away from the injection site, not always, but, it, but in most cases. And of course, when thinking about this from the theory and modeling side, we, we want to know well, what is it that's controlling that process. Um, here's an example from uh, Basel, Switzerland. This is a distance from the injector. This is uh, uh, time. And so you can see the cloud of micro seismicity spreading out. People fit these with either a diffusion model, so distance proportional to square root of t, or a constant rate model. If you use the latter, then um, in this case, for example, that that the seismicity spreads out at 70 meters per day. Um, and typical rates you know, vary over several orders of magnitude from a meter per day to, to a kilometer per day. And a number of explanations have been proposed for this, the, the simplest being linear pore pressure diffusion, uh, whether that's through the sort of a uniform permeability structure or whether it's, it's primarily concentrated in, in high permeability fault damage zones is of course, an open question, the latter is probably more likely given what we know about uh, the geology and permeability structure of faults. Um, poor elastic stress changes have been in invoked uh, as well as aseismic slip. And it's that latter hypothesis that I'm gonna examine today. And the idea would be that injection causes a pressure increase which triggers aseismic slip. And then that aseismic slip loads small seismogenic patches either on that fault or in secondary structures around it and triggers micro seismicity. And so as the aseismic slip front is migrating out, it produces the micro seismicity pattern that essentially tracks that, that aseismic slip front. Um, yet one more example, and I'll return to this a couple of times, and I, I thank Bill Ellsworth for drawing this one to my attention. So this is an, an EGS um, project in the Cooper Basin in Australia where uh, here's one of their uh, stimulation treatments showing injection rate versus time. So as you can see, this is just over a couple of weeks. Um, 
peak injection or sort of average injection rates of about 10 barrels per minute. Um, they're essentially injecting in, into a single sub-horizontal um, low angle thrust fault. And here's the in injector and seismicity spreads out in just a huge number of events. Uh, here's the timing of those events shown in days, right? So, you know, you see the, the lighter colors, the earlier in time being closer to the injector spreading out. And you can just you know, get an estimate of that migration rate by looking, you know, here goes about to go about one kilometer, it takes about 20 days, and that gives you a, a migration rate of about 50 meters per day. So again, fairly consistent with what's seen in, in other examples. Um, these are seismic events, and if you do some far field seismology analysis, looking at moment and corner frequency, you can get source dimensions that does require, um, I guess, and if you assume a, a fairly low stress drop, then these patches of seismic slip, they're repeating, and they, they overlap and end up producing about, again, about 20 centimeters of slip in the center and decreasing outwards. If the stress drop is higher then these patches, presumably don't overlap, they're much more uh, confined. And in that case, there might be a seismic slip accompanying this. So what will our modeling seek to explain, right? So the observations are uh, a centimeter to a meter of slip happening over a month to a year time scale. And of course, uh, and as you might expect, and, and as I'll show uh, from our modeling, that depends on the initial stress state, injected volume. Uh, the slip migration rates range from a meter per day to a kilometer per day. That depends primarily on initial stress state as well as injection rate. And the modeling will also produce, uh, predict that prior to the onset of significant aseismic slip, there's a quiescent period. And the modeling predicts um, also you know, when during injection, let's say if the stress is sufficiently far from failure, uh, then over a year to decade timescale, you don't trigger significant aseismic slip. Um, and I'll point out that uh, at least in the first study that I'll present today, the, the main one I'll focus on, we're not explicitly modeling microseismicity, just the aseismic slip. Uh, but many of my colleagues have, have done similar models, not necessarily with, with fluids present, but they have a, a fault that is velocity strengthening, so it slips primarily aseismically, and they embed small seismogenic or velocity weakening patches in it, and you get microseismicity. So there's, here's just a number of, of many, many studies that, that have examined that. Um, another recent study that adds secondary faults, and, and that pops off uh, microseismicity as slip occurs on the main fault. So our, our modeling, our, our model builds on a number of, of studies. Uh, most of these studies utilize a one-way coupling from pressure diffusion to slip. Uh, we'll do a full coupling as, as I'll explain in a second. Um, here the model is drawn as if it's 2D anti-plane shear. So we have a, a fault uh, running along here loaded with constant normal stress. Um, I'm drawing the shear stress being applied here as if it's anti-plane shear, uh, but quasi-static elasticity. Um, there's a nice, for a planar fault in a uniform hole space, there's a nice mapping uh, between anti-plane shear and plane strain. So you can uh, view it either way that you like. We'll be in directly into the fault at a constant rate. We'll have pressure diffusion and flow confined to the fault damage zone. Uh, and then the fault will be allowed to slip according to rate and state friction is so very commonly used uh, friction law for earthquake modeling. So what's the context for this work? Um, there've been a number of, of studies. I'll just highlight what's happened in the past couple of years. There've been uh, a, a number of really, really talented um, modeling groups getting interested in, in the coupling between fluid flow and fault zones and, and fault slip. Um, Bhattacharya and, and, and Viesca had a paper in Science pointing out, uh, they developed a model with one, essentially one-way coupling from linear pressure diffusion to slip with, with constant friction coefficient. And they demonstrated that when you ac account for fault slip and the elastic stress transfer that occurs because of that, then that can drive aseismic slip in a diffusive manner and it has an effective diffusivity that can be, uh, in many cases, vastly higher than the hydraulic diffusivity. Um, 
So in that case, it's not, you know, you look at, at a micro seismicity cloud migrating out and it's not necessarily the hydraulic diffusivity that's controlling that, but something somewhat different than that. So really important insight from that study. Uh, the study that's most closely related to ours was by Pierre Dublanche. Uh, he utilized a one-way coupling from pressure diffusion to slip, just like uh, Bhattacharya and Vieska, did it with velocity strengthening rate and state friction and demonstrated that there's two phases to the injection response, an, an initiation phase where there's negligible slip and then the onset of, of aseismic slip migration. And his model predicts uh, migration at a constant rate. So in contrast to the diffusive migration predicted in, in this previous model, uh, they soon after added velocity weakening patches to produce micro seismicity and permeability evolution, but, but neglecting uh, porosity evolution and dilatancy. Um, Dimitri Garagash recently published a paper applying linear elastic fracture mechanics that helps explain why you get constant rate migration rather than diffusive migration uh, in response to localized injection into the fault. And these are just a few of, of the, the studies. There's obviously been, been a lot more and I'll draw your attention to just a few of these. Um, as I pointed out, we're gonna assume that um, flow and pressure diffusion are confined to the fault damage zone. And so we need to look at the fault permeability structure. Um, usually the core of the fault, the very center of the fault is uh, very fine grained um, clays or phyllosilicates. It has low permeability. That's where the slip occurs. Um, the high permeability structure is the damage zone that surrounds it. Uh, sometimes there can, it can be simpler like this or more complex like shown on the right. And it, this essentially maps to a permeability structure drawn in cartoons like this. So most of the pressure transport I think is happening uh, within the damage zone, and then there's communication into the central core of the fault where the slip happens. So we'll assume that that, that process, that equilibration between damage, zone, pressure equilibration between damage zone and core happens on shorter time scales than we're going to attempt to resolve uh, in, in our model. And there have been many, uh, at this point now, many field and, and lab studies um, linking the damage zone permeability to the actual structures, microstructures like microfractures. Um, here's just one example from uh, Mitchell and Faulkner plotting the, the fracture density versus distance from the fault. It, it decreases. You have more fractures near the fault, less farther away. And then they went in the lab and they made measurements of permeability and correlated it to the microfracture density, right? So this essentially, you combine these two together and you get a map of, of permeability as a function of distance from the fault. Um, you'll note in some of these structures, uh, these tectonic faults that were active at depth, the permeabilities can be, be quite low. Um, I'll argue that I, I think for the shallower induced seismicity that, that most of us are here care about, um, permeability is likely quite a bit higher. So our fault zone fluid transport model is a standard 1D pressure diffusion model. It's a standard porous flow model with K being permeability, viscosity, uh, porosity, compressibility. Um, and we're going to source it with um, a delta function injection in the center. Uh, Q naught is gonna be a constant rate turned on at time equals zero. And it's a linear rate, or you can think of it as a Darcy velocity. And we need to think about how we would convert um, a volumetric injection rate, capital Q, into this linear rate or a Darcy velocity. And that requires thinking about the cross-sectional area through which uh, the fluids are flowing. I'll give you two ways to think about this. Um, one way to think about it would be uh, we have a fault of some a uh, fault zone of some width here, I've just taken it to be a meter. If you prefer 10 meters, that may be more representative of some of the, the larger faults. Um, so you can adjust these numbers. Uh, we're gonna spread it out over some distance here. I'll just assume a kilometer say, and say you had uh, pressure injection or injection happening somewhere over here into a permeable layer the fluid and pressure diffuses along here and then enters a fault. You could flip this on its head, you know, diffusion through the arbuckle going down into basement faults for example. Um, and so in this case, the, the fluids would be entering this model or entering this fault zone vertically. And that relevant cross-sectional area would be this width times this length. Um, so if we do that type of thing, and you know, we estimate 
product of a meter and a kilometer, we get this cross-sectional area. Then we can convert a volumetric injection rate, here it's in uh, barrels per month or liters per second, um, into a, a Darcy velocity or a linear rate. And so here I, I take values that, that range from those characteristic of a saltwater disposal well all the way up to what you would see in, in a high rate injection, say during hydraulic fracturing. And so that allows you to convert this, uh, these volumetric rates into uh, linear injection rates, the ones that will appear in our model. Um, another way to think about this, if you're in injecting directly in, into a fault zone and it's spreading radially outwards, would be a picture like this. So here's the well delivering fluids into the fault. It's spreading out in this, in this disc shape. And so here the relevant cross-sectional area would be the damage zone width here times the circumference, so 2 pi r. Um, an example here would be the Cooper Basin. So I'll just plug in some numbers from that. Uh, they this is injection in, into granite, um, which is essentially impermeable as compared to, to a, a narrow damage zone. They estimate and report that to be about a few meters. So I'll take three meters. Their injection rate, as I showed you, is about 30 liters per second. And the radius, of course, varies from very small near the injector to large further away. Um, so I'll just pick a typical value, say one kilometer. And plugging in these numbers, you get a linear injection rate of 10 to the minus six meters per second. And so this is the nominal rate that we'll use in, in our reference simulation, although we'll explore some higher, some lower. Uh, our model also has another term here, which is a dilatancy term. So in addition to elastic changes in porosity, which enter through this, this compressibility here, you can have inelastic or plastic changes in porosity. And if you dilate the pores um, inelastically, that creates a suction, right? So the undrained response neglect this and this, if, if the uh, porosity increases, you can see with the minus sign here that creates a suction, a reduction in pressure that can help stabilize the fault and strengthen it. Um, our model for porosity, plastic porosity evolution, we use a, a model that's become fairly widely accepted and widely used in, in earthquake modeling by Siegel and Rice. Um, where the plastic porosity evolves towards a velocity dependent steady state via slip velocity. And this uh, steady state porosity um, increases as the log of slip velocity. And this is consistent with some, some experiments that Chris Marone uh, did some, I guess a couple decades ago. Um, epsilon here is a positive constant in, uh, experimentally shown to be about 10 to the minus four. And so we'll use, we'll use those values in our modeling. Uh, we then account for permeability evolution in response to this porosity evolution by using a, a standard power law relationship with some positive exponent alpha. And of course, this is coupled with friction. And so here we use rate and state friction where it's a relation between the shear stress tau the effect of normal stress, sigma n minus p, p being pore pressure. And f here is a friction coefficient that depends on sliding velocity and state. Um, I'm not gonna teach you about rate and state friction, but I'll, I will point out that it, it's in this model, it's velocity strengthening. So it's under steady sliding conditions, the faster you slide, the higher the friction is. Uh, so generally in, in most cases that leads to, to stable or aseismic sliding. And then we use what's called the slip law for state evolution. Our model accounts for the following coupled processes, right? So injection is gonna increase pore pressure. That's gonna weaken the fault trigger slip. That slip is going to cause dilatancy. It will increase porosity. Um, so that dilatancy directly decreases pore pressure, but at the same time, it's enhancing permeability, which enhances diffusion and, and can uh, either allow the pressure to diffuse uh, faster or, or in some cases make it larger. So in our simulations, we'll use a reference permeability of 10 to the minus 13 meters squared um, and other transport properties like the storage properties and viscosity that give you a hydraulic diffusivity of about 10 to the minus two meters squared per second. And we'll generally consider faults that are um, at a few kilometer steps about uh, I think 50 megapascals initial effective normal stress and we're gonna place the initial shear stress about one megapascal from failure. And we'll adjust that. That turns out to be a, a really critical parameter. Um, the model has 10 non-dimensional parameters. So there's a giant parameter space to explore. So we're only gonna focus on, on a few of the most important parameters. Um, 
Just one quick aside to justify the fault permeability of, of 10 to the minus 13 meters squared. I think many of you are familiar with the um, in situ experiments by Guglielmi, uh, where they, they uh, isolated the zone surrounding a fault, injected into it, injection rate, pressure, and actually slip and, and opening. Um, and there have been a number of modeling studies that match the um, pressure, you know, the in injection rate and, and pressure, as well as slip. And those studies suggest that this fault has uh, permeabilities. Well, different studies get different things, but they're generally in the range of 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13, sometimes a, a bit higher, right? So here's a, um, by Bhattacharya and Vieska, here's an estimate of that permeability. And you can see it's centered around 10 to the minus 12. So we, we'll use a value that's about an order of magnitude lower than that, but we'll consider uh, some range in, the, in that property. Um, okay, so what does our model predict? It, it has two phases. The first phase, uh, injection brings the fault to failure. There's, there's negligible slip, but the slip velocity is accelerating. And then the second phase is slip rate, uh, constant rate migration. So these are the kind of plots I'm gonna show you. This is um, the model we're going to, this is distance from the injection point. This is time. Uh, the simulation is entirely symmetric about uh, zero here. So you can imagine that exactly the same things happening uh, below here. So I'll just show one side of that. Um, and so here's, this is showing slip velocity. It's in a logarithmic scale. So this is 10 to the minus seven meters per second, which it, it, another way to think about that is, is about a one centimeter per day of slip. Now it's about the peak slip velocity in these, these models. So it's quite slow. That's why it's aseismic. Um, and so here's that first phase labeled one here, right? You can see the slip velocity is, it's non-zero, but it's essentially negligible. And then something happens here, conditions change and you get the onset of an aseismic slip front that migrates outwards. Um, it, there, it has an unsteady uh, migration rate at the beginning, and then it kind of settles into constant migration rate. And if you look at distance and time, it's about 20 meters per day in this example. Um, I'll also sh sometimes show you uh, plots of slip. These are slip contours every 20 days. So this, th this is... Um, slip now plotted on this axis. So at some point, at some time, you have this much slip, 20 days later, it's this much, 20 days later, it's this much, and so on. So you can see here in this example, after 200 days, the, the peak slip is about um, uh, what is it, 20, 28 centimeters or so in the center of the fault. The, uh, let me take you through these phases in a little bit more detail so you can understand what, what's happening. So now I'm gonna show you the, the pressure change. This is the, the pressure change due to um, injection and also dilatancy caused by, by slip. And the white color is, is zero pressure change, red is positive, blue is negative. Um, here in, in phase one, which lasts about 30 days, it's essentially linear pressure diffusion. We do have some slight nonlinearities because the permeability and porosity increase as the pressure increases, but it's a, it's a minor effect. So this is basically your standard linear pressure diffusion response and it increases pore pressure by a few megapascals. Um, the, it, during this process, you can see the slip velocity is small but increasing and it's a little bit, uh, with rate and state friction, it, it's kind of different than Coulomb friction. So Coulomb friction, you have the reason that you, that there's a transition from no slip to slip is that you're taking the fault strength and which is friction times effective normal stress. And as you inject and pressurize, you decrease that fault strength and you bring stress or strength down to uh, the stress value and then fault slip happens. It, it's different with rate and state friction. Um, so in this case, the, because the fault has not slipped, the shear stress must remain the same, but the effective stress is decreasing and stress is always equal to strength in rate and state friction. And so a decrease in effective stress must be compensated for by an increase in friction. And so this is a plot of friction coefficient. So you can actually see it increasing here at the beginning and what that does um, in rate and state friction is it causes an acceleration of the slip velocity. Um, that's known as the direct effect. So at, at early times, 
Um, this friction coefficient can be written in this way. Here's some initial state variable. It's essentially constant until you have enough slip. And this is known as the direct effect. A is a positive constant, V is the slip velocity, and this is a reference velocity. So to, as friction coefficient increases, it does so by causing this increase in slip velocity. And it does that until um, slip reaches what's called the state evolution distance. And then the friction goes from this high value and drops to a lower value. And that provides a, a very rapid drop in shear stress that causes slip and begins the slip, um, initiates the migration of, of this slip front. And so then that migrates outwards and that's the beginning of, um, of, of the second phase of injection. You'll note that this rupture, the actually the change in friction coefficient <clears throat> in the center of, of the fault here after it's been slipping goes back to its original value. So there's not really a drop in friction coefficient. That's not what's driving the rupture in this case or, or the, the, the slip. Um, so what's happening? Why is it, why do we get a seismic slip front? So all in, we're in our phase two here. Now we'll focus on the slip migration. Um, this is again, the slip velocity and, and pore pressure. Um, it's, a, it's a forced process, a driven process. So the, the sustained injection here in the center of the fault continues to pressurize the center of the fault. You can see the pressures increase up to about five megapascals here, here after 200 days. Um, and that con continues to drive weakening and slip in the center of the fault. Um, that will transfer stress outwards and essentially force and drive the rupture. Um, you will note that there's a, a blue region here, a, a pressure decrease or a suction, and that's the dilatancy effect. So at the onset of slip, at, at, at the beginning of the slip front, um, you're dilating the pore structure and creating this reduction in pressure. And it turns out that actually slows down the slip front. So here's just another way to look at it if, if, um, if you, you're not familiar with those space time plots. So this is taking a slice uh, through the solution at 144 days after injection. So it's essentially right along, along here. So kind of in the middle of phase two. Uh, what's being plotted in blue is the change in shear stress. In red is the change in pore pressure and in black is, is the slip in, in one here is, is actually 0.1 meters of slip. So I'll take you through this. So what you see in the center is, is an increase in pore pressure. That's what you would get from injection. The discontinuity and slope indicates that there is that, that source term. The pressurization is triggering slip in the center of the fault. It's peaked around the injector. That slip there is accompanied by, by a, a reduction in shear stress. And that shear stress uh, or the reduction here transfers the load out to the um, periphery of, of the slipping zone and into what are essentially crack tips. And just like any, any fracture or crack problem, you get a stress concentration at the crack tip. And it's that elevation of shear stress that can in help initiate slip. And it's really driven by this elastic stress transfer outward. The weakening um, is occurring near the center. And you do see the uh, effect of dilatancy here, which is this reduction in pore pressure um, at, at, the, at the slip front and extending a, a tab ahead of it as a, because it is a diffusive process. The other things we can plot here uh, just for completeness are slip velocity in a log scale. So you can see it's, it's fairly uniform sliding in the center of the fault, maybe peaked a little bit near, near the crack tips. Um, and then you can also see the permeability structure here. There is some elevation in permeability in the center. That's that permeability enhancement. But at least for the model parameters we've chosen, it, it's only a factor of four permeability enhancement. It turns out to not be that important. If, you, if we neglect the permeability enhancement, it doesn't change the solution uh, that much. The dilatancy in contrast does have, have a larger effect. So let's return to one of the primary predictions of our model. So that was just one example reference simulation. We did a whole suite of these simulations exploring a number of parameters. Um, and it turns out the two that I think 
our, we have hopes of quantifying and or controlling are two that actually control this migration rate quite substantially. So one is, is the stress date, how close the fault is to failure, um, and the injection rate. And so what's plotted here is the migration rate of a seismic slip as a function of injection rate. And the different curves here, the different colors are different closeness to failure. So shear over initial effective stress of 0.6 dropping down, right? So this is, green is really close to failure and blue is further from failure. And the nominal friction coefficient on this fault is, is, is uh, given here, right? So you can see, you can get, just by changing the stress state at the same injection rate, you can get an order of magnitude difference in slip migration rate. Um, and the range of injection rates here is the one that I, I argued before, kind of spans the range of, of everything from uh, sort of low rate injection into a disposal well to high rate injection during hydraulic fracturing. And it, the data or the simulation seem to be well explained by, the, uh, by a power law relationship between injection rate and uh, slip migration rate. The Cooper Basin example that I showed you at the beginning, we estimated the injection rate um, at least out at one kilometer from the injection site to be about 10 to the minus six meters per second. In closer, it would just move you to the right here. Um, and the slip migration rate was about 50 meters uh, per day. So it seems quite consistent with this model and it would you know, then require a, an, an initial stress state to be close to, but not quite at uh, at failure. So I think all the pieces kind of fit together and it, it is connecting well with, with the observations. Um, it, this may be somewhat surprising, and, uh, but it turns out that the permeability has a fairly minimal influence on the migration rate, at least a much uh, smaller effect than the initial stress or injection rate. Um, that's shown here. So the different curves here are for different permeabilities varying over two orders of magnitude. The blue actually is a, with the highest um, permeability. The, the slip front has actually not reached a, an asymptotic constant rate migration. So I think if we actually ran it for longer, all of these curves would collapse onto a common curve. And that's actually something that's consistent with um, the theories that have been put forward by uh, Pierre Dublanche and Dimitri Garagash. It's essentially, in that case, you get the pressurization is localized in the center of the fault. Um, and the slip is, is propagating uh, well outside that zone. So the, all of that pressurization turns out that the cumulative effect of that becomes independent of, uh, of, the, of the permeability. Now, there's an important caveat here, which is that this is all true if we neglect fault normal flow. Of course, if you account for fault normal flow, then as you increase permeability, at least permeability perpendicular to the fault, then you can bleed off some of the fluids and the pressure, and then, then that ought to slow down the pressurization and slow down the, the slip migration rate. Uh, the permeability, however, does control the spatial pattern of slip. So this is showing, um, this is our reference simulation in the middle and decreasing uh, it, uh, permeability uh, to the left and increasing it to the right. And at the, the um, Oops, I'm sorry, the, the other way around. Uh, so this is this one is the higher permeability, this is the lower permeability, right? Higher permeability has a higher diffusion length. It allows pressure to spread out uh, further along the fault. Um, and so you get a more uh, sort of elongated uh, distribution of slip, whereas for a, a lower permeability, you know, the pressurization is larger and more concentrated here. So you get more concentrated slip. Um, Here's the, from the same simulations, here's the plot of the pressure change, right? So the, the high permeability lets pressure um, diffuse outwards faster. The pressure changes near the injector are smaller. The lower permeability effects are more confined and, and the pressurization is, is larger uh, near the injector, right? Which is why you get more slip near the injector. Um, so that's how permeability influences this problem. Uh, it turns out the maximum slip near the injector is controlled primarily by the injected volume, it's less sensitive to the injection rate. Although of course that, that spatial pattern, is, as I mentioned, it depends on the hydraulic diffusion length and that does depend on the um, injection time or the rate. Um, so here we, we vary the, uh, whoops, 
injection rate, this is our reference simulation, dropping that rate by a factor of two to the left, increasing it by a factor of two to the right. Um, that of course changes the, the slip migration rate, higher rates mean it propagates faster. Um, these are the slip contours and the red contours all course, you know, they're at different days in these simulations, but chosen such that the injected volume is identical across the simulations. And you can see that the maximum slip here near the injector is almost the same in all cases, although the spatial pattern of, of slip and let's say the, the seismic moment or potency associated with the slip may, may be somewhat different. Um, but near the center of the fault, the maximum slip is, is pretty much independent of injection rate and it depends primarily on the injected volume. And that's illustrated in this plot. So we plot the maximum slip, which is at the injector as a function of injected volume. Uh, we're really injecting at a linear rate, right? So this, to plot a volume here, we are assuming some cross-sectional area accepting fluids. Um, and so that maximum slip is shown here as a function of injected volume, of course, increases as volume increases, but it turns out to be very sensitive to the initial stress state. And so this is, you know, fault that's at failure and then some distance, uh, some, some further away from that, right? So again, highlighting, just like we know from seismic slip, right, closeness to failure really matters. And that's the idea behind uh, the fault slip potential uh, product that, that um, that, that the Skits Consortium has, has uh, produced. Um, and it, you know, it, it's the same thing here in, in, for the A seismic slip case. Um, dilate, uh, actually, let me skip that one. Um, our model, I, I showed our model with velocity strengthening friction. If, if we switch that to velocity weakening friction, then instead of A seismic slip, we get seismic slip earthquakes. And here's an example uh, with velocity weakening friction. So we inject into the fall, here's pressure change. So it pressurizes and then boom, here's an earthquake. And this is the dilatancy that's causing that, that suction there. Um, it looks like a straight line here. If you zoom in on it, this earthquake, right, it only lasts about a second. This is plotting slip velocity now in a scale. So you can see the rupture initiating, propagating at about close to the shear wave speed. And it just naturally arrests. At, in, in this simulation at the boundary of the pressure perturbed zone. Um, it doesn't always do that, of course, that depends on the background shear stress. And I think um, there's a wonderful paper by Jack Norbeck and uh, Roland Horn, another one by Garagash and Germanovich that outlines the conditions where you'll get um, ruptures that are either bounded by the pressure perturbation or whether they can propagate beyond that. Um, in, the, in the final couple slides here, I want to switch to another simulation uh, or another set of models that we did to get into to the um, topic of swarm seismicity um, and to really just convince you that our models can also produce swarm seismicity. Um, we've not done this in the context of injection, but we've done it in the context of, of uh, crustal scale earthquakes with tectonic um, fluids. And uh, so kind of you'll see you'll, this is at a larger scale and much, much lower flow rates, but it's essentially the same model. So now I'll draw the fault like this. The fault is velocity weakening here near in the shallow part of the crust, um, velocity strengthening below it. And there's gonna be a, um, we're gonna again, confine flow to the fault damage zone. And we're gonna force fluids in from the base of the model um, at a rate that's about three orders of magnitude smaller. Um, so that's going to kind of slow everything down in this model. So imagine speeding it up and then there may be some relevance to, to induce seismicity. Um, so we're going to force the fluids in from below at a steady rate, but you'll see that there's a lot of um, unsteadiness in, in, in the response of the fault. Uh, and that's as a consequence of um, certain nonlinearities and feedbacks that lead to cyclic pressurization and discharge of pressure pulses that ascend buoyantly along the fault. Uh, it's a concept known as fault valving. It undoubtedly happens in reservoirs too, where you have compartmentalization of pressure and then rupture of some fault or seal. And then you get um, pressure equilibration that, you know, it, it, accompanied by, by fluid flow. Um, so imagine that process playing out in a reservoir. Um, 
in, in this simulation, we have a slightly different model, a bit more ad hoc for permeability evolution. Uh, we first account for um, the fact that permeability decreases as effective stress uh, increases, right? So um, along these, these curves shown here, K star is, is a reference permeability. And we let that reference permeability evolve both with slip. So it increases, um, maybe look at this, this plot down here. It, it increases with slip from some low value towards some target high maximum permeability over some slip distance. And then we have a healing process that's probably negligible on the, the time scale of, of injection induced seismicity, but important for, for uh, tectonics, you know, where you have healing towards some minimum permeability. And that's due to all, uh, all sorts of both mechanical and, and chemical healing and sealing processes. Here, it's just a, a time scale that we introduce. Um, here's kind of the, the main result I want you to focus on. This is, is showing uh, these two plots is plotting the log of slip velocity. Um, so the plate rate is 10 to the minus nine meters per second. This is 10 or one meters per second. This is like a, a, an, an earthquake. Um, and the bottom of the fault creeps, and this is plotted as a function of time, and this is plotted as a function of time steps. We use adaptive time stepping to zoom in and resolve the earthquakes. So the bottom of the fault creeps, the top of the, the fault is, is locked, Fluids being forced in from below pressurize the fault, drive a seismic slip upwards. Uh, you get these interesting a seismic slip fronts that sort of penetrate into the seismogenic zone. And then uh, when it reaches the uh, velocity weakening part of the fault here, it triggers an earthquake swarm. So kind of zooming in here now in, in time steps, you can see these are each, uh, this is a set of about 10 earthquakes. Um, pop, 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 pop. And this is a, a somewhat confusing plot of, of cumulative slip. The blue contours are every one and a half years and the red contours are during the earthquakes themselves plotted every one second. So here's a small earthquake, a larger earthquake. Here's the swarm propagating upward. And this pattern repeats uh, quasi periodically. Um, <clears throat> here it is shown in a movie. So these are the, the plots of slip velocity that we were just looking at colors shown here. This is slip velocity versus depth in a linear scale, in a logarithmic scale. This is the permeability of the fault, the upward fluid flux, and the effective normal stress. And I'll just play it so you can get a sense of what's going on. So here are these aseismic slip pulses, fronts migrating upwards. It's really a, a pressure pulse, right? It's, it's weakening the fault, reducing effective stress. It triggered a small earthquake there. The pressure pulse continues to rise buoyantly. Um, that weakens the fault. It drives uh, a seismic slip. Um, it increases permeability, so it allows fluids and pressure to diffuse upwards more. Here's another a seismic slip front that's spontaneously generated. It's infiltrating the seismogenic zone. It pops off another earthquake. And it, you can see this, this pressure pulse is just making its way upwards through the crust. Um, now it's going to enter what I think is the most interesting phase uh, for you all, which is an earthquake swarm. So the pressure pulse continues to ascend, and but now the, the, when the fault slips, it does so primarily seismically in these pop, pop, pop uh, earthquake events. Um, and gradually that process over about a year uh, increases the permeability, allows that pressure pulse to fully make its way up to the surface, and then it does trigger um, a large earthquake. So just zooming in on that, um, here's the, the log of slip, this is just the earthquake swarm, and this is uh, depth versus time. So you can see it takes about a year for the, this earthquake swarm to ascend um, about you know, five, or, five or six kilometers. This is as a function of time steps. So you can see each of these earthquakes. Um, this is effective normal stress, right? So you can see that overpressure pulse weakening the fault as it, as it ascends and increasing the permeability. Um, one important point here is that you'll notice that these slip events overlap one another. Um, I find that quite interesting. And actually, that's something that was uh, suggested to have occurred in the Cooper Basin EGS example, that the same slip patch is, is popping off um, in, in seismic slip uh, multiple times. And it, it seems consistent with, with what we're seeing here in these simulations. 
Um, so let me conclude now, uh, I'll return to that first steady, right? So injection into velocity strengthening faults can trigger a seismic slip, but first there's a period, the quiescent period, um, and then they, the slip only initiates if the fault is sufficiently close to failure. Uh, it, we find that the model predicts constant slip migration rate, not diffusive migration. Um, and these rates range from anywhere between 10 and, and, a, and 1,000 meters per day. Uh, that depends a lot on, on the rate of fluids entering the fault and also on, on the stress state. Um, the migration rates are only somewhat sensitive to permeability, although the slip pattern does depend on permeability. Um, we get a, anywhere from a centimeter to a meter of slip. And that depends on the injected volume. Um, but take these numbers uh, with certainly with a grain of salt because the mapping between uh, volume per unit uh, area does depend on what we assume for that area, right? Both the long strike distance and the damage zone width. Um, the maximum slip near the injector does seem to be mainly controlled by the injected volume, although rate and permeability do influence the pattern, whether it's spread out more or more concentrated. Um, and then in the last study, I showed you that, that these models, um, even in the absence of really any, any imposed heterogeneity, spontaneously develop the kind of heterogeneity and probably in, in stress and, and permeability that is required to produce swarm seismicity. And when that happens, the slip patches actually overlap. Um, that is with velocity weakening friction is something that I, I think um, the modern community has just beginning to explore. So I expect to see a lot more coming out in, in the next few years on that problem. Um, and I'll finally point out some important, uh, some limitations and extensions, right? So in our model, we neglected fault normal flow. So essentially what, what you might think of as leak off outside the damage zone, um, which will reduce pressurization might mitigate some of the, the somewhat stabilizing effects of dilatancy. Um, and we've also not really explored um, parts of parameter space where there's lower injection rates or low, lower flow rates into a given fault structure, um, as well as what happens if, if we have lower permeability and porosity. Um, we do explore the, these, uh, this part of parameter space in that second tectonic study. Um, but not in the context of injection-induced seismicity. So I do expect sort of a longer quiescence period um, and slower slip migration rates. Um, and this is actually something that, that we're actively working on now where we're trying to match um, Carissa Pepin's observations of aseismic slip uh, in, in the Delaware Basin. And it looks, it looks quite promising, but it's premature to present that here. All right, so thank you and, and I'll take questions now. Thank you very much, Eric. That's uh, a lot of good information, very thought provoking uh, material, I think. Um, so while the audience is putting, there's some questions on the, the chat window, but uh, while the audience is thinking more, I'll maybe kind of kick it off. Um, I, I'm intrigued by your, uh, what you described as kind of the dilation C section um, pressure drop region at the at the uh, the tip of the migration. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? You showed one sensitivity with permeability, but in terms of the the amount of pressure drop and the extent, how would that be controlled? For instance, do you think by injection rate, or what other controls might might there be on that? Yeah, let's see. It's a good one to illustrate this. Uh, what I believe. So th this is a nice example because it, it shows different permeabilities and you can see for the higher permeability, you know, this, the, the slip front is actually kind of tra tracking right up here and there's not much of an effect of dilatancy. Um, I think that's because the pressure diffusion is, is that the pressurization from injection is, is really advancing fast enough, the hydraulic diffusivity is high enough that it, it sort of pushes into this region and, and partially counteracts those suctions. Um, and that's in contrast to when the, the permeability is really low, right? The pressurization, the, so the, probably, this is probably the hydraulic diffusion um, distance along here, this front. So that marks the boundary between pressurization and then the, the dilatancy. So this is, um, and we do some analysis to show that there is an essentially undrained region uh, near the crack or behind the slip front. So, so the, the uh, 
there's sort of, yeah, so this is essentially undrained dilatancy and, and it's just the fault is slipping there, the pores are dilating, you're getting this undrained uh, drop in pressure. Um, it would be the kind of thing that would be quite interesting to look at if you had multiple wells crossing the fault and you had an aseismic slip front passing. Um, you know, this effect depends a lot on what's assumed for that dilatancy parameter. There's some experimental constraints on that, but they're, of course, at the lab scale, and it's not obvious exactly how to scale that up. Um, I guess moving on, Ethan Grigoritz asked a question about uh, how realistic is it for uh, a seismic slip without uh, small earthquakes? Um, it was posted early, so it was maybe before your your comments of velocity strengthening and weakening. But well, you, it, it's probably I think there's examples of both happening. Um, the example by Carissa Pepin here, um, of course, there are some small earthquakes, but nothing nothing close to explaining the, the 20 centimeters of slip that's that's inferred for these faults. Um, whereas in, in this example, you know, it could be that it's, in, you know, the, the slip that's occurring could be entirely seismic or it could be a mixture of seismic and aseismic. Um, the reason our model produces only aseismic is that we have velocity strengthening friction everywhere. I doubt that, and we only have one fault. And I doubt that, you know, that's obviously not the case in, in the real world. There's going to be secondary fault structures. The stress field will be more heterogeneous. So some, some secondary faults will be closer to failure, maybe in a, a slightly different rock type. So they have velocity weakening properties. And you'll get micro seismicity that accompanies this. Um, so in this study, we didn't attempt to add that heterogeneity into the model. Um, but as, as I mentioned, a number of my colleagues have done that and, and, and indeed you get both the aseismic slip and the seismic slip. Um, in, that, in the case where the embedded velocity strengthen or velocity weakening patches are small, so most of the slip is aseismic, those velocity weakening patches, they slip seismically, but they basically slip the same amount as would be predicted in, in a purely aseismic model. Um, so I don't, you know, I think Yes, there could be some slight changes, but I think many of the same predictions, say, of migration rate are, are fairly robust, even though we don't account that for that heterogeneity explicitly. Uh, Ahmed Kajide, sorry, mispronouncing the, uh, the name, but uh, asked a question for your seismic swarms, if you'd looked at any memory decay behavior or maybe more generally does it uh, when you when you see those uh, seismicity patterns do they follow frequent expected frequency magnitude relationships as well uh, I think it's perhaps asking a bit too much of a uh, these are all two-dimensional simulations and I, I think it's just asking too much of a, of a 2d model to try to reproduce that um, we're also limited as modelers in uh, Sort of minimum link scales that can be resolved in this model. So there's an important link scale or slip distance called the state evolution distance. And we know what it is from labs, lab experiments in the range of 10 microns or something which under certain stress conditions give you a minimum earthquake size of a few meters, right? Consistent with the occurrence of a very small seismicity. If we use those values in simulations, we need grid spacings that are a centimeter and there's no way we'll do, you know, 50 kilometers of the lithosphere with one centimeter grid spacing. So we simply can't resolve those small earthquakes and we can't use those lab values of state evolution distance. So as modelers, we artificially enhance that by several orders of magnitude. So here, you know, the smallest earthquakes that we can resolve are, are probably, you know, in the range of a, of a few hundred meters, right? That's the smallest one. So for computational reasons, we don't we're not able to reproduce a broad distribution of magnitudes. Um, and furthermore, in 2D, I think the predicted frequency magnitude distribution may be, be somewhat different. Um, I think you know, going forward, as people start doing these in, in 3D and using some of the larger supercomputers, we're going to get a broader 
uh, magnitude distribution. And then that's exactly the kind of question that, that we would ask of our model as part of validating the model. So thanks for bringing up that point. Great. And then, uh, Pat McClellan asked a question, uh, if you're aware of any, uh, any direct observations of maybe casing deformations or, or downhole well deformations that might, uh, might relate to these observations? Uh, I pointed out one example of casing deformation during, during hydraulic fracturing where the very beginning, it was from the Sichuan Basin. Um, so there was a, uh, almost there, yeah. Right, so this is, this is the, um, you know, the horizontal part of, of, of the uh, well and, and the micro seismicity cloud, right? So here's a fault that's presumably being activated and right where this micro seismicity cloud crosses um, the well, there was, you know, there, were, there were problems during stimulation and, and they put a, a caliper down, down hole and right, and there's casing deformation. The casing was being sheared. This amount of slip was, was larger than what would have been produced by any of these micro seismic events. So it was presumably a seismic. Um, I doubt this is the, the only example of that. Um, so I think now that we have the model and it's producing what we think are somewhat realistic results, right? Now's the time to, to the next step would be trying to connect more with these observations. Um, so certainly, you know, if you know of any, any observational constraints or data that's available, um, please, please let us know. Great, and we're running a bit late, but maybe one, there's one more question. So I'll maybe uh, wrap it up with that before closing this up. But uh, um, Hiroki Sohn's asking uh, a question. If you look at the migration front of the seismic slip and the migration of the seismicity, do you think the two track linearly? Are they, are they aligned or what's the relationship between them spatially and temporally? Um, well, in our first simulation, we don't have micro seismicity, so it's it's unclear. In the in the second study, it's um, back towards the end. It's it's different parts of the fault slip in different ways. So the velocity weakening part of the fault at depth um, here, you know, so the velocity or sorry, velocity strengthening of the part, fault at depth, it it slips in these you know, with these aseismic slip fronts, and it's the shallower velocity weakening part that slips uh, in the earthquake swarm. There's not much, th there's some, but not a lot of aseismic slip happening here. You know, you don't see, there's a little bit of aseismic slip like in blue here, but most of the slip in the seismogenic zone is, is seismic slip. Um, but I think, you know, really our models need to add heterogeneity, secondary structures, before we can properly uh, address uh, address that question. Great. Well, we've run over here a couple minutes, so we'll go ahead and uh, close this out. So first of all, thank you, Eric, for the, the excellent presentation. Um, the, uh, the community, I'm sure there's a virtual round of applause, a seismic round of applause, so to speak, in the background. Um, the, uh, and just a reminder to everyone, the next presentation next month, May 7th, Peter Hennings will be presenting. It'll be actually the year anniversary of this webinar series. So uh, Peter was gave the inaugural talk and he's gonna come back for a uh, uh, first anniversary kind of update. So looking forward to that. And uh, um, if anybody has any further questions, I think Eric agreed to stick around for a few minutes and, uh, and answer questions more informally, but uh, again, thank you everyone and uh, happy Easter. I was gonna ask another one, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about uh, differences between hydraulic fracturing and uh, um, SWDs and in terms of the injection rate, but uh, fracking obviously would be more sporadic kind of injection, on-off injection, depending on, you know, if the, the operation sequence, if it's multi-wall fracturing, for instance. Any insight to that if, if it's uh, sporadic injection on and off? Yeah, we've, I 
we have thought about that, but we've not done anything in our modeling where we, we varied the rate. We figured we'd do the simpler case first. Um, it is interesting, right? You know, to the extent, right? Because injection rate is the thing that you can most readily control. So, you know, if you stopped injecting, does that immediately stop the, the slip front? Um, my guess is that, you know, there would be some lag time, but I think it would. I think this is, is really, at least for the stress conditions and frictional conditions we're looking at, this is a forced process. Uh, there's not much of a friction, if any friction drop that's taking place, place that would drive it spontaneously. So I think if you stopped injecting and you stop pressurizing near the injector, then you stop the you know, additional slip from happening there. And then that stops the stress transfer and stops driving uh, the, the, the crack outwards. Um, of course, you have put fluids in there and you have pressurized it and then you will get some pressure equilibration that takes place. And that process may drive a little bit of extra slip and you know, a little bit of extra growth. Uh, but I don't know how long that, that would persist for, but it's, it's, a, it's exactly the kind of thing that, that we could investigate with our models. And I, and I, hope, I think we, we are planning to do that uh, shortly. Excellent. Excellent. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and jump in here. Hi, hi Eric. Um, this is Hiroki. Hey. Um, th thanks for the great talk. I, I guess, yeah, I, I didn't explain my question so well. Um, so I was just wondering, so this is like a poor pressure driven front, right? And whether you assume a velocity strengthening a seismic slip or these uh, swarm with a velocity weakening fault, you know, I was wondering if there is a difference in how the front migrates with time, depending on which model you choose. Um, but, but, it but it seems like both of them looked like it was more or less going linear with time. Is that fair, fair to say or correct? I think that is fair to say. I, I mean, however, we've not extensively investigated the swarm seismicity part of parameter space. That was something that just, you know, we, we investigated just a tab, but we didn't do nearly the kind of controlled parameter space study that we did in, in, the, in the first aseismic slip modeling study. Um, so that's something I think we do need to look into. Um, there was recent work by um, Dublinche and De Barros where they, they kind of did a similar study with um, to, to what we did in the first one, but they embedded velocity weakening patches. And you know that gives you seismic slip, micro seismicity. And then that, I think, facilitates the um, the stress transfer process and can accelerate it. And so in that case, they see much more complicated um, aseismic slip behavior. Sometimes you get these secondary fronts behind the main front that propagate faster and sort of zip across previously slipped parts of the fault. Um, so a lot of that complexity begins to emerge when you add that heterogeneity. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a good understanding in the field at this point about what, you know, it's the area ratio of velocity weakening versus velocity strengthening and how that influences migration rate and such. You know, you, you'll see, I'm sure you'll see those studies kind of emerging mm -hmm. uh, from modelers over the next few years. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, I, okay, I should apologize too, because I think I, uh, I rushed your question, so I don't think it's poorly <laughs> worded in the chat. No, I, no, 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 I, I, I didn't ask it so well, so but don't worry. <laughs> Any other uh, questions from the, the remaining crowd here? So Eric, I uh, have to say I'm quite intrigued by your your notion of the uh, the pressure drop at the at the tip of this. And part of the fact that I'm intrigued is uh, when I heard you give your skits presentation. Uh, a month or so ago, I uh, just happened to be looking at the same time at uh, some observations from the field, which I think it showed exactly that. We had a instrument yeah. fault and a fault response and uh, a couple wells crossing the fault showed uh, pressure decline with uh, what appeared to be uh, an aseismic front triggering some remote seismicity. So 
I'll, uh, I've been planning to do this, but I'll, I'll kind of, unfortunately it's, it's, as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> sensitive proprietary information, but be happy to uh, kind of reach out and step you through it. Okay. Right. I mean, the, the, you know, the other thing to investigate for pressure changes would be a poroelastic change, right? You have slip here, and then you look at the undrained poroelastic response somewhere on, uh, you know, some distance off away from the, the slip front and maybe even in the absence of dilatancy on the main fault, you know, you can get a poroelastic stress change that would be a suction, right? So I think that would be the alternative hypothesis that would be important to test and try to distinguish between those two. Right, right. These wells yeah. are, and pressure drops are probably on the fault that's being activated, that, that's the thing? Uh, presumably, but... Um... It's it kind of small region of the along lateral with uh, um, where the fault would uh, potentially influence and the pressures, single pressure measurement for the entire lateral. So mm -hmm. it's right. actual resolution, but. Eric, I have a question. Uh, so your model for uh, pressure front uh, evolution is based on uh, slit flow, right? There is no porosity, to, or porosity is 100%, right, for, for that slip flow. But, uh, you know, you consider a gap and the, the, uh, the uh, cross-sectional area is just the cross-sectional area of a slip flow. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, for this high permeability, you could change it to some uh, porous media instead of that. And then in that case, uh, the pressure front will move faster because it needs uh, to occupy a uh, smaller space? No, it is, it is a, um, you know, phi here is, is the porosity and it, it's, mm -hmm. um, I think we use it, 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 it evolves, but it's nominally about uh, 0.1. Um, oh, okay. And so the Q here is a, it, it is a Darcy velocity, oh, right? Darcy so velocity, it's okay. It's the volume of fluid per unit total surface area. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, th this divided by by phi would be the fluid particle velocity. Um, yeah. So when do, when doing this calculation, it is it is you know so we, because it's a Darcy velocity and not a fluid particle velocity, we're dividing by the total cross sectional area. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, for uh, okay, uh, exactly. So for Darcy velocity, it would be the porous rock uh, cross sectional area, but. Uh, uh, interstitial velocity would be higher than this. It, exactly, yeah, by about a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Eric, uh, can, can I ask a little bit detail question? Uh, sorry, this is okay again. Um, yeah. I, I was just a little bit confused with why the friction coefficient is low inside the aseismic slip patch. Yeah, I, I saw you mentioned that in chat. Um, uh -huh. It, it, uh, yeah, I think for this audience, I wasn't going to go into it, but um, for, for example, here, here's something that's somewhat counterintuitive. So we, we varied A minus B. So this is less velocity strengthening and more velocity strengthening. And it's the more velocity strengthening one that goes faster, um, which may be somewhat counterintuitive to, to people, but I is, is actually quite consistent and, and you can kind of think about it. I think this panel on the right kind of explains it best. So this is friction coefficient, log velocity, the three simulations, trajectories at, at I think this is at the injection point are shown in, in the different colors. So we pick some initial conditions that sets an initial slip velocity and initial uh, friction, which is basically initial shear over effective stress. And here we start them all at the, that same initial stress state the direct effect is the same because we've held A, the rate and state A the same for all of them. So the initial evolution is, is just that increase in friction as you pressurize the fault. And then state evolution happens somewhat differently for each of these, um, but brings the fault to some steady state here. And so the, the steady state friction our, our curves are, are shown in, in the dashed lines here, right? They're straight lines in, in this log linear scale. And just because of where we anchored our, our reference velocity and reference friction here, um, it actually makes the more velocity strengthening fault 
have lower steady state friction. So this one gets a bit of a friction drop, whereas the blue one, you know, the less velocity strengthening actually gets a little bit of a friction increase. You can also see it here. These are just trajectories of friction versus time, right? So the, you know, there is a bit of a friction drop in the center uh, for this case versus the blue case where there's a friction increase. And so that, you know, whether or not you get a friction increase or a drop in friction controls whether there's a little bit of extra stress drop or stress increase that can either drive the rupture or, or inhibit it. And that's what leads to the, these different uh, slip migration velocities. I see. Right, so, so what I think is the most important would be, you know, given a, given a friction law, calculating what steady state friction is at the aseismic slip velocity and comparing that to the initial shear over effective stress to know if you're gonna get a drop in friction or an increase in friction. And I think it's less important whether it's actually, you know, strongly velocity strengthening or only mildly velocity strengthening. What really matters is what that steady state friction is as compared to the initial initial condition. I see, yeah, thank you. I, I was really intrigued by how the migration velocity changed so much with slight difference in the initial stress. And um, it, it, it yeah. seems to suggest like, you know, there are only few, may, maybe not all reservoirs exhibit this asysic behavior if the stress is not that high. You know? Yeah, I think, and you know, you can think about a given reservoir that has some stress state and then you know you plot your Mohr circle for to examine faults of different orientations and it's only the ones that are are close to critical that are probably going to that you'll probably trigger a seismic slip on in in a finite amount of time um, and they're the ones that are going to have the largest a seismic slip and it pretty quick you know it was a pretty nonlinear relationship right mm -hmm. um, yeah. and you know, we saw that in say in the in the maximum slip or the or, or in the migration rate. Where's the max slip? Um, right, you move away yeah. from the failure and it drops. It drops really substantially. Very rapidly. Yeah. All right. Maybe maybe you do you know sort of fault slip potential, but it's an aseismic slip potential. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. It is really um, interesting. I I need to follow these these uh, stream of works. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's interesting. There, you know, I think not so much was happening for a while, and suddenly now there's an explosion of, of uh -huh. uh, all these modeling papers. Where you know it took us, a, I think, the, those of us in the modeling, a, a, you know, some years to learn porous flow and then add it to our model and get everything numerically stable yep. and coupled together. But but. Many groups now have that in it, it so I think you're going to see a lot of these. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So Eric, I think I'm going to jump off myself, but uh, thanks a lot for the for the presentation and uh, have a have a good day. Have a happy. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Eric. It was very interesting talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Eric, I have a quick, okay, Eric is gone. Okay.